morning. Uh, my name is Tom Rando. I'm the Deputy Director of the Stanford Center on Longevity. And I've had the great good fortune of working with Laura Karstensen and more recently Jim Johnson over these past 10 years. Um, it's been the greatest part of my career at Stanford and it's been a true pleasure. It's great to see everyone here this morning and thank you all for coming. Um, we have a very special treat to start our program today and quite a longevity storyline and that is a conversation with Wendy Whelan. It's difficult to capture the magnificence of Wendy's career in a few short sentences. Um, she began her dance training at the age of three and went on to spend an incredible 30 years at the New York City Ballet, 23 of those as principal dancer. She's danced virtually every major Balanchine role, worked closely with Jerome Robbins, and originated leading roles in works by such notable choreographers as Twyla Tharp, Alexei Rutmansky, and Christopher Wielden. Since 2013, and especially since her retirement from the New York Ballet in 2014, Wendy has been pursuing what we would call here a kind of encore career, a next phase, I'm really reinventing herself in the world of dance outside of ballet. Before we invite her to the stage, we'd like to share with you a trailer of a documentary titled Restless Creature that follows Wendy through her final years at the New York City Ballet um, as she really struggles with, with pain, with surgery, with rehabilitation, and ultimately a return to ballet, um, including a very remarkable and a poignant uh, final performance. Um, so this documentary was released in theaters um, last summer and was recently made available on iTunes and on Amazon. So could, could we roll that video, please? I've always been extremely devoted to what I do. Every once in a while, when somebody pops up with that gift, you just grab it. Nobody has had more new works made upon them. Where's your camera? Right here. Right here. She is already the finest instrument, and so we had to start learning how to play that instrument. Ballet can be tough on the body. And to be a ballet dancer at 47, I do feel the ticking clock. I was having a phase where they were sort of taking me out of things without talking with me about it. After my class, I literally could not walk. Surgery could really help my issues. Ballerinas are probably God's best athletes. It's pretty hard to think that you're not gonna put point shoes on someday, you know. I had a meeting with Peter Martins and he so I just don't want people to see you in decline. Part of me is embarrassed because it's like, you know, you're 46 years old and you're still dreaming like you're a teenage kid. You know what? I don't want to plie on that. Because it hurts or just because it's... Well, it did the first time. People are now calling me the former ballerina of New York City Ballet. <laughs> a lot of people think I retired already. You've made this place so great, and I love you. There's nothing like those relationships. I know it's unrealistic to think that I can dance ballet forever, but tears in my heart. Knowing how much I can work in the future is the question left to be answered. So please join me in welcoming a national treasure, Wendy Whelan. So Wendy, welcome to Stanford. Thank you. Um, so we'll have a, a conversation and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. I'm sure there will be many, many questions. But just to get started, I wanted to talk to you some about your career and the film. Um, you've been very forthcoming um, as, a, as an artist, as a ballet dancer about age and its mm -hmm. effects. And I'm just wondering what you think in terms of what you're doing now and with um, Restless Creature, in terms of giving a voice to others who are also dealing with issues of being around or past peak performance. Thank you. Ahaha. Uh -huh. 
Well, Restless Creature was the first of four full evening works that I've um, sort of created with collaborative partners um, in the three or four years that I've been freelancing. Um, uh, ballet, I did the, the exercises, the, the structure of ballet for 45 years, and my body did not want to do it any longer. My brain didn't want to do it any longer. It was like I was putting myself in a shoe that I was too big for, and I needed to get out and explore new movements in my body, um, new ideas in my brain, and new collaborations in my heart. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've just been trying to find new people to play with, um, to learn from. I've continued to find um, myself as a student. And therefore, I always feel like I'm reinventing, like I'm like starting again from the bottom a little bit with all that I've learned along the way. So, so do you find that others in your profession, for example, dealing with this issue of looking toward being at their peak and then, and then considering what comes after, do they, do they approach you about this? Do they ask you your advice? No, they don't. Um, because I'm pretty new at it. But, and, I'm, and you know, I was 20 years older than the other, my colleagues. My last performance, the dancers I was dancing with were 20 years younger than me. So they've had a long way to go. <laughs> and they don't want to look at it. I didn't want to look at it. They're in their prime. They're focused. Um, they're working 10 hours a day, every day, except for one a week, for years at a time. And that's how they do what they do and maintain it. Um, the people that came before me, um, no one really spoke about the transition from a ballet career onward. It was very private, um, somewhat shameful for some people, including myself. I felt a bit of shame in being old at 45 um, or younger for some people. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a topic people really talk about. That's why I, I went ahead and made the film. I did not want to make the film originally because it was just too sensitive um, to be a ballerina and discuss weakness. Um, and the people that went before me, mostly gentlemen went on to leadership roles. Women went on to teaching positions. Um, and I'd like to try to break that in my own way. I don't, therefore, I don't want to be a, a, a director of a ballet company, but I want to lead in a new way with what I'm doing now. So, so it, you know, in the film, you approach the kind of end of your ballet career or your mm -hmm. time with New York City Ballet, clearly with a sense of this is the end almost of your life. I mean, you almost yeah. speak of it that way in the film and as if there's nothing beyond. And clearly there is, and clearly you've devoted your new energies to new things. So now, now when you look back at how you're approaching the end, I mean, do you think you have something to share? Maybe not with the young immortalists who can't think, you know, they're, 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 they'll live forever. Yeah. But people who really are sort of going through that same kind of angst that you were going through, um, do you have something to share with them? You know, it's, there's, there's life after ballet, I mean, and, and, and there's a new life and a, and a good life. Or, do you, do you think mean, they'll there's, believe you? There's so, uh, everybody, uh, um, goes about it differently. One of my colleagues, um, a core dancer in New York City Valley, came to Stanford. And she lives in San Francisco now and has a family. Um, everybody's different. Uh, I wanted to continue moving my body and exploring movement and performance um, in different ways and with a different mindset. Um, so everybody has a different way of going about it. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so I mean, it's interesting what you say, to, especially about this dichotomy between uh, the sexes in terms of their progression through and then beyond. Um, so it's clearly an incredibly demanding uh, career. I mean, incredibly hard. The question I had was, as you're looking at people who are going through this, especially the young, very young mm -hmm. teenage girls and boys, yeah. um, do you see that there's almost a balance between achieving the highest level of execution and longevity? Meaning, are, are there ways that people are sacrificing the length of their career for high achievement early? And, and would you, you're not going into teaching, but would you structure the training differently if it, you thought it would lengthen people's career? And, and do you see that even in your own? I do teach. You do? Just so you know. I, I do a little bit of everything now. I try to, anyway. 
Um, one thing I do now that I didn't do as a dancer is I do yoga, I do gyrotonics, I do, um, I, I give my, I have more time for myself. I don't have to be in the theater 10 hours a day, which I kind of did at, at the time. So the stress of that alone wears you down physically and mentally um, and limits you and it puts the blinders on you. Um, so I think it's up to the dancers themselves because the, the leadership thus far, they will just want to wring right, out the lemon, right, you right. know, and just take all the juice. So it's up to the dancer themselves, um, and I try to give this to people I work with, to look at all the avenues, look at all the doors, you know, go for the focus, but don't ever take your eyes off on all the things that you can get from all the different things that you can't imagine you'll get from. For, from a purely physical perspective, in terms of challenges to your muscles, your joints, your bones. I mean, do you think that, that there is a, a trade-off that's being made, as you say, people are being kind of wrung to, to reach the highest level that will in fact shorten their career? I mean, do you see any change in that? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, of course, as kind of what happens in professional football. Yeah. And, and going back down to football at the level of the elementary schools, are people looking at this profession as being fairly short-lived for people other than yourself. Yeah. Very few people make it anything like you did. Right. And is that because of the kind of incredible stress very early on? And is there any change in that? It's really hard to say. It's so individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people finish at 30. Some people think in 25, I'm, you know, this isn't what, this isn't mm -hmm. for me. I've given my life to it so far, but I think I need something else that will take me farther in a different path. Um, because it, we do know that it is short when we get into it. Um, but there's something extraordinary about it that committing to going to that place will get you to. Um, there's an element of combining artistry with the athleticism and the spirit that come that you don't get as a child. You get that out of the practice and the maturity and the mastery of the art form. And that's something I didn't know as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's something I did feel. That's something that kept me there. Um, that I wouldn't have gotten if I'd left before I was 30. Mm -hmm. I only started to get into that part of myself as I turned 30. Great. So, yeah. Okay, great. So, so we, we'll, we can start opening uh, the floor for questions. We have people with microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll have people um, deliver a microphone to you. Um, so just while they're, they're moving, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit of a personal question. So obviously in the film, you invite the filmmakers into very private, personal aspects of your life, including into your surgery. They into the, op the, into the operating room. <laughs> <laughs> so they were there. Yeah. Um, as you look at it now, the, uh, the whole documentary, do you see aspects of your own persona reflected, you know, hold up, hold up a mirror that you didn't expect, that you didn't see before? Oh, but, oh yeah. I see, my, I see a, an extremely stressed out woman <laughs> in the film. And a lot of people have, that I've done these talks since the film has been out, and they're like, you look so good. You know, like <laughs> stress really ages you. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I feel like a very different person, you know, three years mm -hmm. later. Um, so I, I didn't realize that that's the uh, persona and that's the energy that I was emitting. It, it comes out the in the film, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see if we have questions. Yes, uh, Jack Mormon, US Japan, Medtech Frontiers. Uh, Dance, uh, ballet is a sport, an art, um, a uh, athletic activity, <clears throat> but it has this unique aspect of uh, the really bad shoes, the effect on the feet. And <laughs> I noticed shoes. in the uh, picture there the, that you're barefoot yeah. because it's a limitation uh, for at any level, and I wondered if you'd comment on whether or not that's going to continue and whether that's you considered a limitation that the shoes uh, and the way in which you have to use your feet are particular and special for that particular art? Um, that is an interesting question. I never thought about those shoes as bad shoes. Um, <laughs> it was my choice to take off my shoes now, um, but I, I have a friend that's a colleague and a, and a phenomenal artist who's 54, and she still wears them every day, and she mm. performs around the world um, at the highest level in the work that she chooses to work. Um, I don't think the shoes had much to do with um, my ballet um, sort of 
decline or age. Uh, I, I, could, I could still have them on if I wanted to. I do know that the arthritis that comes um, in the ankles and the joints um, is a real reality. Um, but my arthritis that was my biggest issue was in my spine and my hip. So my feet were no problem. Um, it was more on me, the spine and hip. So I don't know if that answers you. I hope it does a little okay. bit. Uh, next question. Jameson, uh, stress is a huge factor in longevity. Yeah. So you obviously had to have uh, coping mechanisms in dealing yeah. with stress in your career. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about those coping mechanisms? Um, my mom, as I grew up, was a, was a college female basketball coach. So I think I learned sort of a, an athletic mindset, a real way of focusing, of sort of projecting what I wanted to achieve and um, applying that in what I do. Um, I surrounded myself with people that have good energy. I did not stick with uh, the negatives. Um, I chose the teachers that I wanted to work with that would help me feel confident and strong and supported. And I always had a tremendous sense of humor. And I think that that was huge. Hi, Carol Heimowitz. I'm at SCO as a fellow, a big fan of yours. Thanks. You talked about um, the transition of starting over, and which so many people are going through as we live longer. And you, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what it's like going from being a master, really, at what you do to having to be a novice again. Can you share one or two experiences of what that's been like for you? Um, I think the main thing that I'm coping with is just sort of the stigma of being 50 now. Congratulations. And um, in the dance world, um, most choreographers, um, you know, I have to seek them. They're not really going to come and go, oh, you're exactly what I'm looking for, <laughs> you know. Um, and the contemporary artists that I want to work with, um, they know that they would need to have time with me. And, I, and that's what I want from them. And that's not every artist. So I have to be very um, specific with who I go towards and how I cultivate a project. Um, and that's not easy at all. So that's what I've been grappling with at the moment. Um, and getting presenters to understand what I have to offer. Um, I have no problem with teacher schools, you know, wanting to offer me a place, um, but it's the stage that I, I have a hard time, I feel, with people understanding that I, I'm a, I still feel extremely relevant. Yeah. Andy from Avenidas, and um, I have a question sort of based on that. It sort of dovetails. Um, you're still a master, so I the question, the, the, the concept of you becoming a novice, mm -hmm. and I know that dance is both art and sport, and yeah. sort of the, the expectation is that you leave the, you leave the art really at the peak, but I don't think that from what I'm hearing is that your dancing is unpeaking. It's that you're creating an opportunity for a new form of this art. And sort of rather than working with choreographers who you have to, from what I'm hearing, almost convince to work with you to get to know who you are, I would see that this is an opportunity for tremendous patronage on your part to sort of develop an entirely new specter of dance post that what we expect, what the expectation is, what high dance looks like. Mm. So. Is that something that you might be interested in, in sort of creating a new art form of dance from where you sit for the next 40 years? Um, I have in my imagination a plan for the next 10 years. I'm trying to find a home that will take my plan. 
and allow me to explore my body, my artistry, my physicality for the next 10 years. Um, so far, I had one meeting. I'm having another meeting when I get back to New York next week um, with a, a place to call home. Um, I'm not a choreographer myself, which I really wish I was, because I could create my own voice, my own language. Um, I need to have someone structure something for me to express, um, because that's a very different art form than just being a dancer. Um, and I'm finding in this time that I've been away from the ballet company, um, what it is that I'm good at and what it is that I you know, need support from. So I would love to find that. I do not want to label it as um, an age thing. Um, I think that gets in the way, um, though people automatically just will see me and think of me as that because it's just the way the dance world sort of is. Mikhail Baryshnikov um, is someone that I've tried to sort of uh, shape myself as in my own way. <laughs> I can't be him. But, um, but he's gone on and he started his own uh, art center in New York and has been somewhat supportive of me. Um, and he's gone on to do this for himself. Um, but he's also brought in other artists, new music, new theater. Um, so he makes it a whole scope of art rather than just dance. So that's where I'm finding myself a little bit um, trying to go, but I don't have the name Barishnikov and it's a little harder. So I, I want to do that, um, but I need some, I need, I need support. So, so you know, at the end of the day today, we'll have a reception where we have jazz musicians yes. spanning the kind of spectrum of age. And, and that's, an area, that's an area of art in which age seems to have not played a major role in defining the, the field. Now clearly um, ballet, as you were doing, right. is going to peak at, at some earlier ages. Yeah. But can you envision kind of an area of dance that has that reflection of like jazz musicians of having 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60, 70, 80, 90, you know, as being a, a in itself a, a legitimate and respected um, aspect of the profession. Yes, but that's I mean, gonna take, take a, a long, long time. Long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's sort of what you're, what you're sort of uh, look, I, looking yeah, toward. Yeah, I would love yeah. to do that. It would be um, heavenly. Heavenly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm a trustee of the San Francisco Ballet and a huge mm -hmm. fan, mm -hmm. so thank you for all Thanks. your great work. I want to ask, I'm so glad you talked about what Baryshnikov's doing because in yeah. so many ways his exploration with photography yeah. and with theater is mm -hmm. sort of maybe a template for all the different directions you can go. I'm curious what has surprised you when you've been able to take the brakes off and <laughs> try a new collaboration. What surprised you and how do you learn from that? Well, the collaborations are what I live for. I love being in the studio. Um, this year has been one um, since the summer that I have not had as much time in the studio as I've ever had in my life. So um, I worked consistently through my career and for the first year. Um, and then you, if you see the full film, you see I have a surgery in the film and that was a reconstructive surgery of my hip. Um, after a year, um, I had a full hip replacement because it was, there was nothing left. So with my new hip, I could show you all that I can do. <laughs> um, I have absolutely no pain anymore, which I had tremendous pain for four years straight. Um, yeah, uh, I wanna be in the studio. The more I move my body, the happier I am, the more focused I am, the, um, um, I get depressed when I can't move my body. Um, that's been the main thing. When I'm in the studio, I'm fine. And challenging things, I love. Um, trying new ways of movement, yoga, gyrotonics. Um, these things have been incredibly helpful to 
my whole overall body. Um, I, just, I just need to keep a focus on whatever it is that I'm going to eventually do. If there is one thing, whether it's dancing or writing or teaching, if I don't have a focus, I can just fold it up and, you know, it's over. The focus for me is everything. And um, so I'm seeing where that focus takes me, where, where I can get through to keep my focus what I want it to be. And, uh, you know, realistically, what evolves in the time that I have. Hi, uh, Christine Keeper with the Finra Investor Education Foundation. So I'm going to take you outside the world of dance for okay. just a question. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is, mm -hmm. um, for athletes yeah. uh, uh, with tremendous promise and with mm -hmm. typically shorter than uh, a typical career re retirement age, um, we worry a lot about financial security and discussions around uh, saving for a an early retirement in, in, in someone's mind, but then many years for a next career. Do you find that in the world that you were in that there's discussions around that and how, and, and whether there's, there's any conversation that could be um, instituted there? We have um, an annuity program. So uh, luckily I listened to one of the older dancers when I first joined the company and when this became available, he said, do not miss this, get that little bit out of your check every week for your whole career. So I, I did that, and it's sitting there. And when I'm 60 something, I'll be able to touch it, but I have, you know, 12 years to go. Um, when we left, when I left the company, we were, giving, we're we were given um, a, um, a little tiny package of uh, 10 years, uh, worth of a week's pay or something, and um, half of that $20,000 that I got went to pay for injections for my hip <laughs> because I thought, oh, this, you know, my doctor recommended this specific doctor in Germany. It's like, I think he can really help you. So um, it, it, it didn't help me. So um, yeah, it would be great to have that. Um, but like I said, it's there. I just can't get it, you know. So, but I also have connections with amazing philanthropists in New York who worked with the ballet that loved my work and that support my work. Um, that, you know, as long as I have work, they will help me. So. Where are we? Where, okay, sorry, back there. Hi, Jody Holtzman of AARP. Uh, you had a, uh, a quote in the clip that I wrote down, and I probably got it wrong, but I think you encapsulated uh, something that pretty much everybody in this room deals with, but you mm -hmm. said it more succinctly than, I, than I've heard it. And it was something like, I'm 46, but I, can, but I still dream like a teenager. Yeah. Could, could you just speak to that a little? Yeah, I don't, I, I'm 50 now. Um, I feel like I'm 30. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what, what to say. Um, yeah, there's just a, a, a social limit on uh, something. They, they see a little bit of this, they see a little bit of this, and all of a sudden you're, it's, you know, you're flipped. Um, or they've had enough of what you have to say, and oh, we need something fresh, we need a new flavor. I don't know, I, I, I just started getting my voice, I felt, as I turned 30, and, and it, it gets stronger all the time. And um, in the ballet world, it wasn't, you know, in my particular ballet world, at New York City Ballet, um, a strong voice wasn't um, embraced. You know, just, just do your work and, you know, make the company look good. But, you know, don't tell us the truth. You know, don't tell people, you know, maybe all the, the tough stuff that goes along with it. I don't think that our, my administration was very excited about this film. <laughs> um, so, 
But then again, I don't think it was a terrible thing about the film, but I, I think a lot of younger people um, have come up to me and I, and I asked them, did this scare you? Because that was a fear. I didn't want them to be scared. And most of them were like, no, I want to go take class now. So, and that makes me happy. Um, but I also had a lot of people come along. Um, my, um, the people that were selling the film said, oh, we don't want to buy this film because it makes ballet, you know, look not so great. So I don't know, it's just, I don't really know what to say about all of this stuff. It's just life, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> social, it's, so, it's social, it's, I think it's economic, it's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Tom. Uh, hi, Tom Moore, uh, hi. a member of the advisory uh, council for the center. Um, you have achieved the level of master and you did it it and have been there for an extraordinarily long time, particularly in your field. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, as everyone in, in, your, in your art and field looks up to you and learns from you, was there anything, if so, what did you take away from those who were younger coming in, in the company and evolving, and in terms of what maybe you got from them that was uh. helpful and was important to your development? Ah, great question. Uh, I would see myself in them, each new generation. Oh, I remember when I was like that. Oh, I remember when I didn't look out for other kids because I'm thinking of myself and myself only. So I started with each passing generation realizing the power that I had um, as a mentor. Um, and as an energetic force of positivity and good. Um, because we've all, we all had to climb, 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 climb to get, find our place. Um, and I, I could look back on that and, and, and not appreciate or be so proud of that. I, 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 I just uh, I wanted to, to try to expose, you know, how do you help your friend? How do you look out for that person and not, um, you know, leave them out dry or, or, or forget that they're there or deny them access to help on stage because you're looking out for your own self-interest? I, I, that's the main thing I, I took from seeing younger people coming in and, and seeing how do you get around from being, having it be just about yourself. But continue being an artist with your own voice. So kind of balance both ways, but, but in, in, the, in the positive way. So. so I think that comes off very clearly in the film in terms of you individually, the contribution you've made to the culture of ballet in terms of it not being only about the prima ballerina, but you reaching out to the tech people, the younger dancers, yeah. you know, that comes off very clearly. I thought one of the other interesting things related to that in the film is what you say about how you learn from your older, more experienced dance partner, which you then teach to your next younger, it's kind of, you talk about it as being a generational yeah. transfer of skill, essentially. And it happens absolutely naturally. Naturally, yeah. 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 And it's not something that's actually even um, scripted. It's just, it's, that's how the, the profession. Yeah. And I think with each sort of level of getting higher, but yet falling to the side a little, mm -hmm. and you, you start to have this opportunity to help your partner or, or a younger dancer, if the opportunity comes to you. I, didn't, I wasn't given the opportunity within the company to become a coach. That wasn't something that I was offered by my boss. Um, I wasn't offered to be a teacher there by my boss. So I was just kind of sent. Other people got that. I didn't get that. Um, I didn't know if I wanted that either, and other people did. So. But the, each opportunity that I had to work with them, a younger person, I realized, God, this feels really good. And it's not about me so much. Um, and I could see their, their development in my own private, personal, working way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah great. Okay, so we have time for probably a couple more questions. Okay. Hi. Hey. 
Hi, I'm Iris Litt, Emerita Professor of Pediatrics here at Stanford. And as a physician who's cared for many young women uh, with anorexia nervosa yeah. that's been at least precipitated mm -hmm by their ballet teacher telling them to lose a few pounds. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your view of whether it's myth or reality that having a normal, healthy um, weight and pubertal development is compatible or not uh, with a successful career in ballet. Is there any functional reason uh, that ballet dancers need to be thinner than normal, or is this something about societal's view of uh, the image of the ballet dancer that we've all grown up with? Uh, amazing question. Mm -hmm. Combination of that. Um, you know, there's an aesthetic to ballet that's in, been in development over the years that it's been an art form. Um, there have been um, styles and uh, athletic prowess that's come into play at different times and at different levels. Um, it's the it's the vision of the the creators and and the and the leaders that that develop this look. Um, you know, there, yeah, it's 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 a little bit of both. So. You know, you have to be able to show a line in the correct way. You want to show a perfection of what you can make with your body with, and, and have it be harmonious with the music and with the craftsmanship of, of the art form. Um, but you have to have the power to sustain. So it's sort of like being on an edge, balancing on an edge of both sides, of the power and of the streamlined aesthetic of the art form. And sometimes you can tip over to the one side and hopefully you have someone get you back. I, I have to say, I haven't seen a, a whole lot of anorexia lately. There was a, a phase in the 70s that I saw that was a little more obvious. I'm just talking in, the dan in my dance, my ballet world that I live in. Um, very few and far between here and there. Um, and generally the teachers that I know that work with these, and generally it's students, get help for them immediately. That's what I've seen in the past number of decades. Great, thank you. Okay, last question. It's uh, Kevin McCain, next day on uh, this is wonderful. Um, uh, you, you described a world of dance that uh, is really tough in many ways. It's intensely competitive. Uh, you described getting your own sense of what you wanted to do at an age when most dancers have to retire. You described a world where uh, people are, uh, you know, uh, permitted or even encouraged to, uh, you know, strive for themselves to get ahead as opposed to helping others. And in many ways, you've moved beyond this in, in your sort of current phase. What, what would need to change in the world of ballet or even more generally in the world of dance, socially or economically, to make it a healthier and better people, both during, for people who are both in it and for those who have left it? What needs to change in this industry? Thank you. Um, it's a little bit of a, a patriarchal. Society. It's a little bit of an older generation of men in charge that have not gotten out and they've had this vision, this certain way of thinking from the generation before them. Um, so there, I think they're, to get to that sort of maybe new, healthy place of the art form. Um, a little bit of a break from the past. So however that comes, I don't know, <laughs> but it, there seems to be a certain um, hold on to the historical, the traditional, 
Um, this is the behavior that we, we do here. So it's a behavioral thing and a, and, a, and a way of thinking a mindset that has been channeled in tunnel vision that needs a little bit of opening up. How can I work that? Break, break it. Break, break that. It. Uh, well, a little. There's a. There are younger, more female, more female directors out in, in the field that are coming around a little bit more. Um, definitely, here and there, the, the the younger dancers are are stronger and and much more self-assertive. In the past twenty years, I would say, um, and. I think social media is, is both bad and good, but good in the way that these kids, these young dancers are like, you know, they're really strong individuals. And um, they're not gonna get pushed around like it was, you know, back in the last century. So it's a little bit different now. So we'll see where it goes. I think the, the young female ballerinas are, are quite a bit stronger physically and emotionally from what I see. So great, on that note of culture change, which fits very well with our mission at the Longevity Center, please join me in, in thanking Wendy very much.